Good evening, God bless you, and thank you for joining us here in Calvary Grace. Will you bow your heads? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, once again, I come to you and I ask for your anointing. I ask, Father, that you'll bring the word to life and that it'll touch the hearts and the minds of the people that are hearing it. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. Genesis 14, 17. At this stage, Abraham's name is still Abram. It's not until later on in his life that God will add another hey to his name, making it Abraham. And it reads, after Abram returned from defeating Kedilomer and the kings allied with him, and the king, of Sod the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, bought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and taken an oath. I will accept nothing that belongs to you, not even a thread or a thong or a sandal, so that you'll never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what the men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men that are with me, to Abner, Eshcol, and Memory. Let them have their share. This story starts something rather fascinating. First of all, this man Melchizedek just simply walks into the Bible. There's a couple of characters that do this. Elijah is one. Melchizedek is one. We're not given any history on him, who his parents were, what his lineage was, only that he was a priest of God Most High. Even that's an unusual name for God, but it is accepted. And he is the king of Salem. Now we know Salem today. Salem back then still exists today. Only today we call it Jeru Salem or Jerusalem. It means city of peace. His name here, King of Salem, is King of Peace. And then we have the actual name by which he's known, Melchizedek or Melchizedek. And that translates to King of Righteousness. King of Righteousness. So whoever this individual is that just stepped out of nowhere into the pages of the Bible, he's both called the king of righteousness and the king of peace. We're told that he's without genealogy, according to the book of Hebrews, meaning there's no history on him. Could this be an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament? Well, I tend to think it is. Not everybody agrees with that. Some believe that he was just a historical figure, a minor king that ruled in Jerusalem. It's possible. But the thing that kind of clenches it for me is the next few lines. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, or then king of righteousness and king of peace, bought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. Now picture yourself there in the Kidron Valley or one of the valleys surrounding Jerusalem. It's hot. You've been to battle. And somebody brings out bread and wine. If it were me, I would have wanted meat. I would have wanted something a little more substantial than bread and wine. 
And so I have to think that these people, even in those days, knew a great hospitality. By the way, Eastern hospitality was world-renowned. People would die rather than let their guests go hungry or thirsty. That's why it's such a big deal at the wedding of Cana when they run out of wine. And so we have this individual who again steps out of nowhere, named the king of righteousness and the king of peace, and he serves an unusual meal to Abram, bread and wine. You know, there's, a, there's an old fairy tale about two little children that were kidnapped. And then they're being kidnapped. They left behind them, they had the smarts to leave behind them, a trail of breadcrumbs. And what I'm seeing in the Bible here is the beginning of a literal trade trail of breadcrumbs. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, bought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. Turn to Genesis chapter, 20, chapter 40 for a moment. Genesis chapter 40. And here we have another completely unrelated story. Or is it? Genesis chapter 40, verse 1. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. They offended Pharaoh. Pharaoh was angry with the two officials, the cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in, the, in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where excuse me, Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, who attended them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king, who were being held in prison, had a dream that same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came, to the, came the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, and there's no one to interpret them. Now, by the way, let me be very clear. Not all dreams have eternal meaning. Sometimes it's too much chilly before bed. There are times when God is capable of giving a dream and gives a dream and if God gives a dream, he will give the interpretation. Amen. Both of the dreams, both had dreams, they answered, and there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said, I had a dream in which I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. And as soon as it budded and blossomed, and clustered, uh, the clust its clustered r clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and put them in his hand. This means, Joseph said to him, the three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you'll be put you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as he used to do when you were his cupbearer. So he says to him, this dream has a meaning and the meaning is that in three days time, you're going to be pardoned. You're going to put the cup back in his hand. By the way, the cupbearer was a very important man. Not only was he a sommelier, but he was also the one that tasted things so that there was any poison in it. Pharaoh didn't get poisoned. So this was a very tense job because that's often how they got rid of one pharaoh and put the next pharaoh in place. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show kindness and mention me to pharaoh and get me out of this prison. 
For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even there, I had done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what, the, what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat away your flesh. Interesting, isn't it? Two dreams. One meant that the man was going to be restored and the other one meant that he was going to die. Well, look at the jobs that these two men had. Because what we're seeing here is part of a trail of breadcrumbs. The first man was a cupbearer. That's a server of wine. And the second man was a baker of bread. Here again, you have these two things thrown together, bread and wine. Bread and wine. Bread and wine. It gets worse. There's a trail of this that just runs through your Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18. By the way, the one that lives is the one that's serving the wine. When you come to the New Testament, the wine is compared to the blood. Those that are under the blood survive. And those that are in the bread or in the flesh don't. 1 Samuel 16, 18. One of the servants answered, I have seen the son of Jesse of Bethlehem. Jesse of Bethlehem. Jesse is the father of David. Who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well. He's a fine looking man. And the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me this, your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, and you guessed it, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul liked him very much, and David became one of the armor bearers, and Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit of God came on Saul, David would take up his harp and play. And David would, uh, then relief would come to Saul and he would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. What was happening here was that a spirit sent by the Lord or commanded by the Lord would come down and torment Saul. And finally, they, would, they, they sent for this boy who was a great musician, a strong warrior and so on. And when he arrives, he brings bread and wine. But notice who this boy is. You see, up till now, we've had Melchizedek. We don't know who he is or where he came from. We've had the baker and the cupbearer. We don't have any lineage on them. We know they're Egyptians. We know they served in Pharaoh's court. But suddenly now we get a lineage this is David, Jesse's son. David of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. The Hebrew for Bethlehem, translated to English, means house of bread. And so this individual that comes from the house of bread brings bread and wine. 
And he enters into Saul's service and Saul sends a letter back to the father and says, let me keep him because he's really good. And, and I just really appreciate what he's doing. And he's 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 able to lift this demonic thing from me. And, and, and it makes a huge difference in my life. By the way, Saul, under the influence of that demon, would literally try to kill David. He would take a spear and he would try to spear him to the wall. He would throw it at him. And every time David would duck and he would miss. But David, when he entered his service, entered with bread and wine. Hmm. There are other mentions, by the way, in the Old Testament of such. But I felt like that was enough. And now we come to another son of David. Take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 6, verse 47. John chapter 6, verse 47. I tell you the truth, truth. He who believes has everlasting life. He who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert and they died. There's a great story around manna, by the way. God caused bread to fall from heaven. Actually, he caused a frost of type to form on the sand. And once it was collected, it could be ground into a, uh, into a flower. It had the taste of honey and coriander. And it sustained them for 40 years in the desert. But when they saw this on the desert floor, they turned to Moses and said, what is it? And what is it translated to Hebrew is manna. Your forefathers ate, what is it, in the desert and they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven. Now we have a different quality bread. Now we have a different type of bread. Of which a man may eat and not die. Now at the risk of going into a lot of unnecessary detail. I'm a diabetic and I have to watch what I eat very carefully. And the one thing that I really love is bread. And there are certain breads that you can't eat. But the wonder bread, that beautiful, white, soft, doughy, amazing tasting bread is poison and will kill me. It will shoot my blood sugar up like you cannot imagine. And Jesus said this. He said, your forefathers ate manna or bread in the desert. And they died. But the bread that comes down from heaven, of which a man may eat and not die. This is the bread which Everybody can eat and not die, but find eternal life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. All the way back, starting in Genesis, we had this trail of bread and wine, bread and wine, bread and wine. And sometimes it, it didn't seem connected. Sometimes it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. Until you come to the final and greatest son of David. And he brings it together and makes sense of it for us. What was the bread representing? It represented him. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man say, give us his flesh to eat? By the way, cannibalism was forbidden in Judaism. Still is today. No way in the world could they eat somebody's flesh. And so when Jesus said, this is my flesh, of which I give for the life of the world, the Jews standing around him said, this is nonsense. This is crazy. This is insane. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. 
unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and here it is, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Bread and wine. From the final and greatest son of David. Verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last day. Now, one thing I can tell you about bread and wine is that it raises blood sugar. Both bread and wine will raise your blood sugar, even if you're not a diabetic. Because it's sustenance, you're taking it in, it has some sugar to it, you'll pump out more insulin, but your blood sugar will definitely go up until the insulin brings it down. It becomes part of you. It gives you energy. It gives you life, like the food that you eat. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. The food and the drink that we have down here gives us temporary life. And we're all in the process of dying, some faster than others. And I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Now I want you to understand He is in his flesh, and his blood is in his veins. And nowhere in the passage does it say that he cuts off a piece of his arm and hands it around. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as real bread and real grape juice or wine would remain in you and become part of you, even to the point of raising your blood sugar and changing your blood chemistry, So the same thing happens here, but now it's a spiritual thing. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. And all of a sudden, it makes sense. We see now why Melchizedek comes out and brings not fresh goat, not freshly killed lamb, not a leg of beef, but bread and wine. Because it's a picture of the final son that will come, who will minister bread and wine, you know it as communion, but we also know it as his body and his blood. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, we read this. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-three. For I received from the Lord that which I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, you'd proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is very powerful. There are those that believe that when it's prayed for, it transmutes somehow from bread and grape juice or wine to flesh and blood. I believe that to be foolishness and not taught in the scriptures. Jesus is teaching a spiritual truth, and to prove it, he is in his flesh with his blood in his veins. But what he is teaching is this. When you partake of the communion, you're partaking spiritually of me. You're remembering what I've done for you. You're remembering what I'm going to do for you. I'm coming again to take you to be with me, that where I am, you might be also. When you take these elements, 
you are remembering the power of the actual body and blood of Jesus shed on that cross paying for your sins a righteousness that is by faith from first to last Jeremiah wrote and I always find this wonderful Let's just go through it. I, I, I actually read this in the last service as well. Jeremiah 31, 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Hmm. Hold it. That reminds me of something. Verse 25, 1 Corinthians 11. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jeremiah says, The time is coming when I'll make a new covenant. What's going on here? Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, would prophesy concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And he would see clearly its future. And he would weep because he knew the destruction that was coming. It's actually believed, incidentally, that he may have taken the Ark of the Covenant and hidden it because he knew what was coming on the nation. He wept so much, he writes a book called the Book of Lamentations. He laments as he writes. And here, in Jeremiah 31, he says, Day is coming, declares the Lord. Time is coming when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. Now let me tell you, every Jew knew this, knew this passage, and knew it well. You read your Bible today when you have time, perhaps when you're not on your phone or on your computer or watching TV. But in ancient times, scrolls were expensive, hard to get, and schooling was non-existent in the secular sense. Children didn't go to school to learn the ABCs. When they went to school, the very fortunate ones that did, they were taught the word of God and they learned it off by heart. They would sing it and they still do it today in the yeshivas. They do exactly the same thing. And so from little tykes all the way up, They knew these passages very well. Now, not every child would go to school. Some would take an apprenticeship and have non-professional positions. But to all of those that were permitted to take an education of some kind, it was always from the Word of God. So the vast majority of the people knew these passages well. And they are watching and they are waiting for this new covenant. And so when Jesus says to the disciples around the table, here it is, boys, this is the new covenant in my blood. What a shocking thing he just said. He said, you know, you've been waiting for what Jeremiah promised. Here it is, boys. Here it is. Communion, by the way, was not a new thing. That might surprise you. But they had done that every year. They would get together and they would celebrate Passover and they would be waiting for the arrival of Elijah. A table would be set out and bread and wine is served on the table. And at this particular table, It was not Elijah that showed up, but it was Jesus. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Back to Jeremiah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. 
because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband of them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord because they will know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. What an amazing thing that we have a forgetful God. He who knows everything about everything since the creation of everything that we know and beyond has said, I will willingly forget based on this new covenant. It starts out in Genesis with bread and wine. And the story builds all the way through your Bible, bread and wine, bread and wine. You're going to find it again in Leviticus. You're going to find it in a number of your books, bread and wine, but it culminates in Christ. It culminates in him. It culminates in his finished work. He is the ultimate son of Jesse, born even in Bethlehem. And he said, my flesh is real flesh and my blood is real drink. And if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have a part in me and you'll have eternal life. And then I saw at the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I'm in Revelation chapter five. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? But no one in heaven on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and wept because no one was found to be worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll with its seven seals. By the way, it's a scroll that is rolled like this. And as it's rolled, there are seals placed here and then it's rolled further down and another seal and another seal and another and so on. So as you open it, you break one seal and you reveal a message. And you break another seal, you reveal a message and so on. I saw the lamb looking as if he'd been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And he had seven horns and, ten, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into the earth. And he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of the him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. slain. And with your blood, you purchase men for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And you've made them to become a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000, and they encircled the throne, the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that's in them singing to him who sits on the throne. To the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell face down and worshiped. You're worthy because you shed your blood. We are just a few days from Valentine's Day. I remember when we came to Canada, I'd never heard of Valentine's Day. 
And uh, suddenly at, at school, we had to make Valentine's cards. And I just had no idea what this nonsense was. But it was okay. It was about love. That was fine. So we were given red paper and told to cut out hearts and stick them onto our card and all the rest of that stuff, as kids are. But the only red that we need is the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all sin and unrighteousness. And without his blood, there is no remission of sins. There is no forgiveness and no eternal life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I'll raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. The one that feeds on me will live because of me. Do you realize everything you eat is dead? Now you may say, oh, that's not true. I eat organic. Well, let me tell you something. The moment you stick it in your mouth, it's dead. Whether it's a plant or an animal, your sustenance costs its life. But when we eat and drink the blood of Jesus and his body, it's alive. And it brings life to us, life eternal. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one that feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. The blood of Jesus is the most remarkable and expensive substance ever made. More expensive than gold or silver or entire nations. It was the blood of God's one and only son who paid the price for your sins. Your forgiveness is solely based in his work. You see, when you come to understand that, you realize it's not your works that save you, good or bad. There are many religious denominations who preach and teach that you must do good works to get into heaven. Well, let me tell you, good works will most definitely bring favor with God, but they will not bring entry into heaven. God will bless those that do good and bless those that do right. And there are in store for those that do so crowns of righteousness. But your good works won't buy you 10 seconds in heaven. You can hand out all the pamphlets you want. You can hand your body over to the flames. But without what Christ has done, it's a waste of time. Eternal life comes through the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all sin and unrighteousness. Will you bow your heads? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that I did not pay the price. Your son paid the price. That he paid what I could not pay he paid a debt that I owed that I could not pay. And I was able and am able to receive eternal life, not because I'm good, 
Not because I'm perfection, for I am absolutely not. I am a deeply flawed human being. But my righteousness comes from the finished work of Christ. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.